All right, I have the uh, the pleasure of introducing our next our next talk, and I've kind of gone through all the slides for the day. This one looks like it's going to be one of the most entertaining ones, with uh, with references to Raiders of the Lost Ark. So uh, I'm assuming we we might be of a similar generation uh, growing up, as this was a fantastic movie in my life that <laughs> that I really it really kind of followed, and I've now had the pleasure of uh, watching it with my children, but. Um, Ron Brash, Director of Cybersecurity Insights at Verve Industrial Protection. One other thing that I'll comment on here is SANS is going through the coolest careers in technology, and we're kind of uh, identifying job roles and job titles. And this is one of those uh, OT-related job titles that stands out. Sounds like an amazing, uh, amazing job role and title for Cybersecurity Insights. Um, Rob is a uh, Rob, <laughs> Ron is a highly sought after uh, speaker, advisor, researcher, and developer with over a decade of experience in ICS cybersecurity, previously working within uh, embedded systems consultancy uh, in aerospace, embedded system developer for Tofino, and specialized in uh, state-of-the-art packet inspection for critical infrastructure. Ron is an active uh, participant in the industrial control system community uh, across the industrial control system community forum. Many uh, kind of follow his uh, his comments in social media and uh, and abroad. Just a, a thought leader in this space. Really, really look forward to presentation. And Ron, don't feel that you have to end on time. Take uh, take the time you need. This this looks like it's going to be fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for those kind words, Tim. That means a lot. Um, so I do apologize. Uh, Bob couldn't join us today. He's kind of in the middle of a period of high availability. And as you know, rolling schedules don't really get to play nice with conferences. So um, hopefully this will be a fun co uh, conversation. I have a lot of Bob's insights into this and what, we, what we've been finding lately. And uh, just kind of even add a little more introspect to this. Andy was talking about a few things that kind of laugh about the old timers or the old guard not worrying about safety. Um, or worrying about technology, well, there's a reason why we still used to dip tanks manually when we did trust gauges. So there's definitely a lot of uh, interesting stuff there. All right. So Raiders of the Lost RTUs, Meters, and Valves, a tale of forgotten hardware and long-lived risk. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, the Raiders of Lost Ark, a movie featuring Harrison Ford and, and uh, all sorts of intrigue, so Mr. Jones, he's a professor, and uh, in short story, he finds an ancient weapon of mass destruction that knowingly has risks. It's opened, uh, shenanigans occur, and then it lies wait uh, securely inside of a, a big hangar in the middle of the de Nevada desert. So kind of how the nutshell of this works, and when we're thinking of oil and gas is, there's this box that's rumored to be, you know, that, that exists, this embedded system, right? We always hear about, oh, there's all these old uh, crafty things sitting in the field. So in the movie, Indiana Jones is approached by two individuals of, a, of an agency in the United States, and he gets uh, basically pushed into a mission that wasn't really his ID, ideal. And then Indiana Jones goes off to the Middle East, uh, off to Egypt, and he starts looking for this mysterious box that is rumored to be uh, to exist. Well, unfortunately, uh, Indiana Jones battles another individual. Uh, in this case, it might be our malicious attackers or just, you know, Joe Blow uh, accident ha waiting to happen. And the, the iconic Germans decided to go use the box uh, preemptively and a bunch of terrible things happen. Indiana Jones somehow survives, uh, just like most of our oil wells will. And so the box will continue to exist uh, as long as it needs to. So that's kind of how I want to set the stage here is these things exist in the past. They will exist today and they'll exist into the future regardless. And, and Rob said a very good quote earlier is, there's a lot of stuff happening in oil and gas today. And there's a lot of stuff happening about the price of oil. And that plays a very big factor in our arguments about security and safety. Oops. So why is this an issue? Um, oil and gas isn't as profitable as commonly and publicly believed. Uh, at least in Canada, I can definitely tell you that. I won't speak for the other uh, other areas of the world, but but nonetheless, though asset, assets frequently change hands, and they usually do it actually in periods like today, where the price of oil falls, and therefore the price of your business falls, or or the price of that field. So this is a really common occurrence. And if you take the average age of an oil and gas well, it's twenty or thirty years. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the numbers of wells, and it's it's probably startling, but there's a lot of wells out there, 
And then you can also think about a well as, as a cost sink, right? They, once they're in the ground and once they're producing, it's, it's already money spent. There's very little investment that I'm going to make on it. So uh, Sean was talking about wheel bearings in a car. Well, I'll try and push it as much as I can until I really need to make a change. Uh, or or that I might try to even wait until that well is uh, orphanable, if we can call it that. So hardware and updates and changes are, are very rare. It's just an additional cost. And it also, uh, it, it can be the fine line between shutting down a well or not. Uh, and usually when you shut down a well, it's permanently. You never, you never usually bring it back up because there's, a, there's a, a negative effect there with a well, which is it'll never get back to the, the capacity that it was before shutdown. Uh, many of these devices were, are serial. They're, they're cheap, uh, but unfortunately, at the time, they thought that was physical security, right? Nobody's going to attack them. It's physical. Uh, unfortunately, human beings decided to go, hey, let's do some automation and let's add connectivity. And so now they're all part of our ICS networks. But they're generally often not IP-based uh, all the way across. So that's where most solutions will fall on their faces. Um, and again, those systems were off, and those fields were often isolated, uh, either by business units, acquisitions, uh, sites, even site ownership. Um, but those, but when we think about cybersecurity for OT, we often think about our usual systems, right? We have our PLCs, our DCSs, our HMIs, but we always forget that end stuff, right? We, we know about SISs from tri Tricon type attacks. We know about PLCs from Stuxnet. We know all of these types of devices, but we always forget about our meters and we always forget about our packs. We always forget about our RTUs and they're probably among some of the, the the richest environments of oopses that you could possibly have. So what kinds of devices? So for the purpose of this talk, um, I'll kind of talk about RTUs, which are a simplified version of a PLC. However, at the time, um, RTUs were really simplistic. However, today they're looking more closer to a PLC and that's typically a pack. You'll have flow meters and th those are done for a variety of things. They have all sorts of uh, mechanisms built in to double check the viscosity of, of a substance. They talk about, uh, they do volume corrections based on temperature. So when you go to the gas pump, right, that just as an example, the, the gasoline that you're getting is measured and corrected to a certain temperature, for example. Otherwise, you might be getting short shifted um, a couple of cents or, you know, a, a, maybe a quart on a tank, but it's, it, it is nonetheless no part of the game. And then you have valves, and we always think of valves as being largely manual mechanical things, but nowadays a lot of them are pneumatic, a lot of them are programmatic, and, and so we need to do consider those as well. And those either can be uh, modernizations of older gear, or it can also be uh, net new gear as well. So this is probably one of the finest slides I think that I had when I was putting this together though, which is where are these devices deployed? Um, they're everywhere. And, and you don't think, of, we think about just them being limited to the oil and gas fields. We, for, we think about these devices being limited to a, a remote installation with a bunch of uh, dr uh, drilling pads. We, we think about that or a pump jack in the middle of nowhere, but that's not necessarily true. A lot of these devices are actually even in refineries that are monitoring the levels in tanks. They're monitoring levels of steam. Um, they're all over the place, but uh, you, you see them for wellhead monitoring. Uh, you'll see them for data concentration. So a bunch of devices will talk to a master uh, gas flow metering is a, is a big population. Block valve automation, so you want to test uh, circuits to make uh, valves go off in a certain uh, sequence. Pump and compressor controls, and even gas stations use a variety of the same systems, albeit pro probably cheaper. But statistically, this is a very important piece here, is when I was looking at the stats, that the wells drilled from 1980 onwards in Canada alone is 430,000 wells. So you're assuming there's a lot of embedded gear kicking out there that is definitely not in any of anyone's asset management systems. Uh, and I can definitely say it's probably all in a spreadsheet for many of these companies. But if I also look at some of the numbers uh, across the border to the south of me, uh, Texas alone has over 200,000 wells. Uh, it's in approximately the same time zone. So when you look at it, there's a lot of embedded devices that aren't showing up in most organizations, uh, asset management or inventories. The other piece here alone is there's over 36,000 kilometers, which I think is something akin to like 18,000 miles or 20,000 miles of instrumented pipeline in Canada alone for one particular pipeline operator. That's impressive when you look at it. This is where I'm talking about, you know, Sean was talking about, we have energy and instrumentation uh, and all these other domains. It's very similar in those regards, but we have all of this pipeline out there and all of, all of the infrastructure to support it that all has these types of devices in them. The last point I want to make on this slide is something very interesting in Canada. 
uh, we, we generally think of cybersecurity as does the device work, are the lights blinking, is it doing what it's doing? But we forget uh, the piece about the data and the sensors on it as well. And, and this is something we often forget. We all often forget talking about the logic that's running on these devices, right? So we, we say, oh, there's a vulnerability for that device. And it's in that firmware of X revision, great. But there's also uh, additional effects that can be uh, exacerbated on the firmware or the logic or the calibrations of the devices. So in this particular section of the slide, what I want to talk about is in Canada, most natural gas wells, for example, or even just uh, oil and gas wells in general, they are only tested for drift and calibration post install uh, between one and five years. Um, and the reason why the frequencies change is based on where they are. So if they're close to population, then they'll be tested more frequently and they need to be reset. Um, but no one checks throughout the rest of the year, for example, if it's a one year calibration cycle. Uh, it's also based on what the proximity of water, but nonetheless, though, this is a very loose environmental concern that might not be under the same umbrella as your traditional cyber risk uh, groups uh, umbrella or the cybersecurity teams. It's a very different operational area. And so this is something very important to keep in mind when we're talking about these types of devices. So part of my talk is looking at this from an asset owner side. I don't want to talk about it from a, from a threat researcher side or a vulnerability side uh, or my embedded background side, but I want to talk about this uh, based on kind of what we do in house. And this isn't a product pitch, but this is a generic sense of how I look about looking at devices, right? This is, this is how I do it. So as part of what I do uh, for, for Verve is we look at asset management devices and to do so, I need to talk to those devices. So what do I do? So when I'm looking at devices, uh, it, it's very interesting about them. And I see that PowerPoint blew up a little bit, but my apologies. So I get a target, a candidate device, right? This is, uh, I might get a new, for example, I was looking the other day at an ABB uh, total flow. So what I might want to do is I can buy the device. I can research it offline. Uh, generally speaking, these devices are cheap, quote unquote cheap. Um, but this is very different than a $500,000 DCS. But what I can do, though, is I can I start to build a, a framework around it and I collect information on it. And so when I'm collecting information, this goes way beyond what I'm looking at just the, the spec sheets, although there's a lot of gifts that are hidden in the spec sheets and in the documentation. For example, they might say, uh, remember that you should be talking to this device over a secure link. I recently looked at that and saw that in a uh, in, a, in uh, the PCCU 32 software hidden in the security menu or in the about menu saying you shouldn't be talking to serial devices over insecure communications. Well, of course, but there's no acknowledgement of that uh, in the actual product manuals themselves. So there's, there's all sorts of gifts out there. And so I add all of this unknown or, or tribal knowledge or folk knowledge as some people call it into, into this framework. And then what I start to do is I start to look for other things uh, when I'm looking for vulnerabilities in these types of devices. What kind of platform is it? Is there, what is the operating system? Is there a board support package, uh, a BSP? And oftentimes, most of these devices are reference designs. They don't really, you, if you can find the original manufacturers that are not the Emersons, the, the ABBs, the Honeywells, you can find what they actually are. And you'll see that it's a VX Works almost de, de facto reference design. You know, probably by default when these were made, they might have uh, the debug symbols and all of, all of the GIFs in there, the debug interfaces enabled or FTP or Telnet. So you can start to do a lot of interesting things. But nonetheless, though, there's, there's all of this information that I, that I put together and I form a hypothesis with. So once I form my hypothesis on what would potentially take down all these devices or, or their op real-time operating system uh, or consume a battery and have it, that's also another aspect is these devices also run for days and days on batteries uh, to crank up the, the usage of electricity, I can also take down some of their extra capacity. But what I do, though, is I always test that in the lab. I'm, or I might even test in the real world if, there's, if a customer doesn't mind, if they have an orphan site or something on shutdown, I'll find my issues and report. So that's my process on how I look about looking at these devices. So as Indiana Jones was starting to look at that box, the Germans jumped right to it and used it. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do something uh, more programmatically and also uh, from an engineering side of things. So based on the devices we've been seeing lately, um, there's kind of four surprises here and one of an expectation. It's never gone until it's gone. So what does that mean? Check if it's dead and shoot it again. Certification of de death does not mean it's dead. So what that means is we've been buying tons of devices off the gray market and customers always say, oh, well, the uh, ABC inter uh, integrator or ABC OEM that did the refit uh, gave us a certificate that destroyed those devices. 
I hate to tell you, I'm buying your devices with your passwords on them. I'm buying them with your keys. I'm buying them with your logic, your nomenclature, as is. And there's, there's a few reasons for that, but I do want to talk about that because this is really important if we do go to retrofit those sites or uh, if someone is not without an unlimited budget, but with a, you know, a particularly uh, reasonably small budget, they can actually get a lot of intel on, on, your, pro on your environment without actually uh, getting access to it. So 100% of the devices we've obtained have all of that information, but there's a few reasons for that. And, and that might be for a few reasons. So I've never seen a device yet that truly has a secure race function. So even from the, cust from the manufacturer, I would secure erase it and then probably load my logic onto it nonetheless, but there isn't any. And, and there's a few reasons. One is the, the file systems underneath, are they have journaling, redundancy, wear leveling if we're talking about flash. Their file systems alone have little gifts that get left behind, even if you did erase maybe the user, part user base partitions. And then just the, like I said, the OEMs, they have no, no idea what secure erase is. And that probably ties to the part where the people that are supposed to be recycling these devices or destroying them don't have access to that functionality. And why don't they? Well, probably because A, they don't have the software to do so, that functionality doesn't exist, or they don't have licenses uh, to do it. So that could be a big piece. And so I like to say, if you want to get rid of a device securely, uh, smash it up with a sledgehammer until it you know, kind of shakes like a bunch of maracas, or you can do the whole acid and vat. But nonetheless, it's, it's not destroyed uh, from a software side. Surprise number two, uh, malware on a PAX FTP server. This is really interesting because no one really talks about it. Um, we've kind of seen lately, there hasn't been any uh, ransomware on embedded devices, except for maybe some stuff like QNAPs and stuff like that. But this particular device was very interesting and it's got a generic Bitcoin miner on it. It's uh, on, and this pack is running VXWorks. But what was interesting about it is that this is a great vector into bypassing all of the controls that you have and, and basically having Joe Blow operator or, or a site admin or tech putting a device inside of what we consider a clean uh, zone and out in the field. And, and often there's nothing stopping that device from talking all the way back up to corporate. So interesting enough, uh, that device had a Bitcoin on it, this particular Bitcoin miner on it, but it was renamed. There was, there was some small differences on it, but it was the same hashes nonetheless. But it was a great vector that I think very few people talk about. And who scans their equipment before install and who scans it on a repeating basis for those file shares? Nobody does and nobody would. Um, but also there's, there's another aspect there is many of these OEM softwares, actually, especially for the VX work stuff, they actually will, like a, a programming software, will talk to these devices and pull those configs back into a privileged position. And that's likely on an, an unupdated Windows box. And so you could actually do far more attacks there and using a, a, what we would call a trusted device as a point of entry into your facility. And this is really true today when the price of oil is, is nothing, right? So when price of oil was $100 a barrel Canadian, um, that was a really profitable mark for us up here in Canada. But when, pr when prices of oil get closer to, to around $36 a barrel, we're not, we're not really making money under the NAFTA agreements. And at $28, we're bare break even. So we're gonna start looking for used equipment or whatever is the cheapest to keep that site running if, if we do have to. So do keep that in mind, the smaller operators are gonna be trying to cut corners and that might be a way where one of these things gets in and inadvertently affects uh, a, a critical, but still a small timing, uh, small timing partner in, in our facilities. Surprise number three, in serial and limited account security, we must trust. So everyone thinks, oh, let's all go back to analog, or oh, let's go back to serial. It must be secure. No, it's the farthest thing from it, although it does take a few extra efforts and it can be a huge uh, a pain. But there's, it's, even, it's even smaller. So we think of, okay, default passwords and pack password strength being terrible. On these devices, it's even more terrible. And that's because they, they use this concept of a, of a combination password and username key. On that password combination key, it's the username and password together. So it's just the same as like a pin code and it'd be all, all ones or all fives. Uh, it's weak, it's usually stored in flat files if you can get access to it. On the right hand side of my slide, I have a, a serial uh, gateway uh, configuration here and the passwords are just in an unsalted MB5 hash. So at the time, MB5 was probably considered uh, you know, the leading edge of, of how to secure your passwords back in the day. 
but now I just need to toss that into a rainbow table. Um, there's no salts. So just keep in mind that most of the time the passwords are also in clear text on these devices and they're not actually even encrypted or even scrambled. Um, but at the time also the physical connections were, 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 were physical, right? They, they were, weren't networked. And when people forget though, that a lot of these devices, it's not, serial isn't just used for data. And, and most operators think that they are, right? They might have a digi modem there talking to a bunch of embedded devices, but that's not true. Um, there's often a lot of ways to get into them. That'll be my next surprise for you when you, when you start talking about that. But there's also a lot of other things where login attempts aren't logged. Uh, there's nothing concrete on these systems. Everything can be reset. There's no forensics possible. And nine times out of 10, they're all defaults. So on surprise number four, if you can't see me, you can't tell I was ever there. So in a variety of these, of these situations, and we're talking about deployments with over a thousand of these devices, uh, they, they are in a very interesting predicament because they're never going to be changed. They're often communicated over, uh, over infrastructure that is also decades old or very legacy. Um, and it, they're, it's, it's just insecure in general. So when we think of, from the infrastructure side, right? You'll probably, you're hopefully will have a VPN and that VPN will allow you to connect and then you can connect to a Citrix, Citrix box or some sort of terminal server and then you can get in, right? Some sort of jump box. That in many cases makes sense from the outside, but everyone forgets what happens in the middle. And that's the networks between these devices and they're often over insecure over the air networks and you could connect to them without being seen. And the reason being is there's very few people actually use encryption on radios. And most of these radios are sub gigahertz, which makes them a prime target for people with SDRs and uh, all sorts of uh, software defined radios and all sorts of creativeness. So I believe there was a talk on this recently, but you could, you could easily inject in here or listen and it would not be an issue. Um, you know, protocols like Modbus RTU, you're gonna pick up and you could decipher in two seconds. So this is not really a surprise that you could do this, but no one's ever gonna know that you're doing it uh, unless maybe you interrupt a polling interval. The periodic polling uh, for most of these devices are often done with the admin credential level, not a read only level. Not that that matters, to be honest. Uh, and the reason why that doesn't matter is the pin codes getting leaked and also the, 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 they have overlapping role based functionality. So even if I had the highest level of permissions when I was speaking to the device or the lowest, um, or particularly from the lowest side of things, I could still get parts of the functionality that should not be available to me, but it's available to a higher level and I can still do things with it. Uh, in this case, for example, um, this is an automatic t uh, tank gauging system and I can lock, I managed to just smash on a few keys on it and off, off I go, I can actually change the calibration of that tank. I can change and I can also do other things like reset all the locks. Uh, there's also this concept of you can deny connectivity by using the only available connection slot. So in, for those that aren't familiar with it, right, remember when you use walkie talkies, uh, two people talk at once, they can't talk. Uh, that's called the cocktail problem uh, when you're dealing with radios. You always need to have a signaling channel. Well, serial nine times out of 10, unless it's set up in a way where you can have multiple devices talking on the same bus, you will actually interrupt them. So if you have a, an IP to serial uh, gateway, often it's, one to, it's a one-to-one. -one. It's an, uh, an IP quintup quintuplet with a, with a port pairing, and that port pairing talks specifically to a specific serial uh, device that's connected to it. Well, if I set up, if I take over the, the TCP connection, nobody can talk to that device over serial. And so I've denied the service to you. Or there's other ways to do it um, in an accidental fashion where people don't tear down sessions and stuff like that. But nonetheless, though, there's a, there's a lot of non-concurrent connection problems uh, when you're dealing with these. Many of these devices too, like I alluded to, they often offer online calibration. They offer log and alarm manipulation. And, and, and you, will, you will see all of this. And, and so the forensics on these devices, especially you would think because of environmental concerns, uh, should be very, very concrete. And you know, uh, what's the best word I'm looking for here? But it, it, you should have no ability, ability to manipulate those, those devices and, the, and those data sets. Please don't ever someone suggest blockchain as a solution. That is not a solution for this case. But um, there's no way to track the ledger for this. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge here. But also, I mean, I can brute force into those devices. I can erase your alarms. It's fantastic. So expectation five, uh, as, a, as I said, they're, they're not going, things aren't going anywhere. These devices will not be going anywhere. Um, 
and there's a variety of reasons. There's a variety of factors on them, but that's that's just going to be life that we have to live with. So on the left hand side, we have kind of a, a very a very simplistic but but realistic version of this. You have a, a, a field or a site, and that site's talking to a bunch of tanks. Uh, it's got a bunch of pump jacks going. It's got you know all sorts of uh, mechanical gear, but it's all serial uh, to a wireless gateway. Um, you might have RTUs, whatever, and then there's an RF link. And that RF link goes right to IP inside of a regional control room. And that regional control room might also talk to an upstream uh, control room that aggregates. But nonetheless, that's, uh, very, often, that's very often the deployment. So why, would, why doesn't this change overnight? Well, one is you don't know that they exist. That, that's a big portion of it. It's very tricky. Uh, the ops guys might know that they're there. But your traditional uh, security folk and products are focused only on looking at what is IP. And when you're looking at things that are just what is IP, serial devices really throw a, a, basically a wrench into that mix because you don't know what the protocol is that's speaking over an arbitrary port unless you're doing very specific deep packet inspection. Uh, many people don't have a background necessarily in looking at binary protocols um, that have been kind of shimmed on top of a, of a TCP frame or what might look like you have a bunch of different devices all talking to one device and everyone's just looking at the fact that that device is a digi, not looking deeper into it. So it's really tricky there. And uh, that, that's one of the issues when you're looking at asset management these, so why you won't see them. Uh, costs, right? The field, if the field's barely making money, it's probably not going to change and it probably won't for some time. Um, LNG in Canada, I won't get into the politics of it, but basically it's a, it doesn't make much money. And um, it's despite the explosion of it, it's, almost as ubiquitous as pulp and paper, where it's a high volume, low cost uh, kind of system. So you're not gonna probably spend any more money if you have to, or you might even divest your assets uh, just to get rid of your risk in your portfolio. Uh, assets again are often not visible and when they swap hands, uh, they just magically show up. So in, in an airport, we think of uh, crash carts, right? So when the sy reservation system goes down, out comes, a sh out comes a cart and magically we're able to do reservations again. And those devices were not uh, connected up until that point. That's true in most of these fields where it, they were standalone. Uh, maybe somebody went out to them in a, with a truck and looked at the gauges, record down values, uh, or maybe someone made an investment and upgraded uh, some sort of data aggregation to them. Uh, to try and optimize the fields, but that's, there's all these types of uh, visibility issues and, and very few companies properly do asset management and inventorying uh, as part of their uh, acquisition uh, phase. They don't properly do their due diligence and so they just inherit a bunch of uh, treats. It's like when you buy a used car, if we're going to keep with the car analogies, buying a used car and if you don't properly check all of the running gear and check the compression, you're in, you're in for a surprise, uh, potentially, not necessarily. Um, the other reason why you might not be able to inventory these devices is they're often over low, very low latency links. So even if they were IP addressed on the other side, you have a 96 baud RF modem that's point to point over a mash radio. Those radios often are even uh, subject to running, having interference with lightning and lightning. You'll see all sorts of TCP resets on them. Uh, and I've seen that in many cases in the energy industry. So, it's very risky if you're unaware of what you're doing and how and how and if you're not looking at what you're talking to, you can roll over the link, but not the site. So do deep in mind that that's one of the concerns that we need to talk about. And that's why also you'll see the OT side of the team uh, raising their hands saying, no, 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 no. Um, the environmental aspects, right? So things are instrumented for environmental compliance. Uh, and then they might also be for automation nonetheless. But one might not lead to the other. And so that you might never change it anyway. So if it's from the environmental side and there's no budget, well, I'll probably never change it. So you'll wind up into, uh, with a situation where you have conflicting interests. And nonetheless, a lot of those devices are not on the management of risk uh, or on the radar of risk management. They're just not. And, and that's probably because the, the boards and the C-suites and the site owners are only familiar with, oh, that's the DCS. We don't touch that. Oh, that's the Bentley, Nevada. We don't touch that. Uh, that's, that's the emergency shut off valve. We don't touch that. Um, th that could be those type of things, or they don't think it has an IP address or an interface on it. Um, because it, you know, in the past it never was used or they don't understand that, uh, something that converts serial Modbus to TCP based Modbus actually has a configuration interface on it that allows you to talk to the device over an undocumented channel. So there's a lot of things there that we always forget. And yet that's always the way, uh, 
the way she goes, the way of the road. So uh, to bring these devices kind of back from the forgotten, uh, you know, depths of, of myth, you need to, to bring them forward and you need to acknowledge and track the risk. And so this kind of aligns with the ISA 62443 standards. Uh, in the most part, I've simplified this process, but generally from a, from a, from a person who goes and looks at these sites, what I try to do, do is I try to take all the information I can, just like I did in my earlier hypothesis of uh, in process of building a, about building out a data set for a device. And so we have, uh, usually I'll get a series of Excel uh, spreadsheets uh, and I'll do a series of workshops and I'll determine the assets and the communications methods required for them. Uh, what I try to do from that is I try to find with the customer uh, something that's represented, representational of a, of a typical site or maybe one that they don't care about per se, but it's also one of lower risk initially. And then that'll be the selection of a champion site. This is where I think most people always think, well, I have all this other information that I've done, right? So if you look at kind of like the, the cyber FAS ops, the A solutions kind of way of things, you have uh, pick and choose your maturity model assessments, uh, if you even do have any for these types of assets or sites. Here's where you can actually do some really interesting stuff. Th that wasn't money that was terribly spent, although I do question the value of some of those types of ass assessments um, by various uh, companies in the world. but uh, you try to align them to your favorite framework, and that might be whatever the organization's using. There's no such thing as a truly bad framework. Uh, you just need to make it yours. You just need to find one that aligns with you. And, and you're able to shoehorn that in there to assess and identify the risks on, the, on these type of legacy devices. From the most side, right, you'll have information from, uh, from FAT assessments. You'll have information from maybe initial studies. You might even have supporting information from RFP acquisitions, uh, RFP-based acquisitions. So you, on the older stuff, you probably won't because that site's changed eight times, but on the newer stuff, you might have a collection of information that, that, that can purely be used to help assess and identify the risks. So if you have a risk, right, chances are there is a solution for it. Well, and that solution might be do nothing, but there's still a solution. And you can always identify the, the, the ways around these devices and what you can do. So for example, if we had uh, an RF link from point to point, and on the other end of it, it was a bunch of serial devices I can't control or touch, right? One solution might be, let's replace the wireless link with a secure wireless link, or can we do something closer to that site where we would go you know, over a, v, uh, over a secure VPN that might be wireless over LTE, for example. And then on the other side of it, I have another uh, a gateway device that actually is more secure. So that you might have some other options there to, to help yourself reduce those risks to those assets versus uh, having a really wide uh, risk exposure environment. Uh, and, th and that's something really critical to think about. And if you can implement the solutions, right, often for these type of devices, we won't rip and replace. Uh, sorry, Dale, that's just the way she goes. Uh, you're probably going to uh, add some sort of competent control. So that might be add in a camera in one of those sites to watch the PLC cabinet, add, uh, add motion sensors on another, on another way, it's just similar to how you do have remote uh, man down systems. But nonetheless, though, you're still going to have to acknowledge your residual risk and state your responsibility for it. So there's no passing of the buck anymore uh, once, these, once these devices become known. And maybe that's one of the hurdles why no one wants to go looking for them. But nonetheless, though, you will have to acknowledge the residual risk and you will have to state the responsibility. And once you do that, you record your decisions and all of the information that you've done. And hopefully you've not put that information back into a spreadsheet, but you've put that back into some sort of technology-based uh, CMDB or in a triangular system. And you're gonna also possibly consider the way that you do policies and the way you do your procedures and the risk and, and update your risk register. And then the, the cycle will continue all over again. But for these type of devices, right, the idea is to not get them back into the hangar where Indiana Jones uh, may wind up in, a, in an extra redo uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the covenant. But uh, nonetheless, though, so that's, that's the, the idea going forward on it. So my key takeaways as we kind of wrap this up uh, to keep things on time, there's six areas that I'd like to talk about here. So for these type of devices, that's your RTUs, your packs, your sensors, your all of the stuff that's you know talking to tank levels, stuff like that, um, or even looking for humidity. Um, your asset and change management for these type of devices, in my experience, has been negligent. There has been no one ever tracking what's really there. They think there's connectivity. They think there's not. They think it's that type of device. They think it's not. They think it's that type of firmware. They think it's not. 
Um, I'm not saying that that's uh, bad and I don't want to be condescending about that, but it's missing. And if you were to try and recover from an incident and be resilient, as Sean was saying, you can't because you don't have a clue what's there and not just don't you have a clue what's there. You don't have a clue on what's actually, it was running at the time of the failure. So you have no forensics. You have no way of actually pro properly uh, adjusting your policy and your procedures, your SOPs to actually get a new device back out and get that well uh, instrumented again. My other point to gain was serial does not imply security. Same with analog, it doesn't. Um, not and now some people might say, well, mechanical is always better, true, maybe. Um, but devices were often secure, assumed as assume the serial was secure and configuration functionality was expected to be local, but it's not. You can do virtual uh, serial uh, redirections on your host and get it to talk to a device on a port that was never supposed to be. Um, some softwares don't even think to say, what happens when a device is not on that port? Oh, that software won't work, so you forget about it. But there is ways to get around that. RF links need security and VPNs, they need attention. We always think of, uh, like the Purdue model where we have a VPN to the PCN, but we always forget that maybe you need a, a VPN or a secure conduit down below to, to your, your pads or to your wind turbines or, or, or to your tanks that are off in the middle of nowhere. That's something to keep in mind. Um, I would even suggest that you would do the same for LTE and links over satellite. Uh, you never know what's, what's occurring and at least you can control some things. Uh, I've seen a position where in Canada, um, even if a network has a certain designation by an ISP to be uh, protected uh, for, for government level things, I would never trust that because as we know, third party risk is a, is a very large challenge to have. And so if you can reduce the risk to yourself, that's a smart, smart call. Um, and most of these VPN technologies are pretty quick these days. Uh, your compliance obligations as well, there's, there's a lot of reporting and a lot of those things are very loose. Um, so if you're, what you want to do as part of your, is a tie in to understanding if a device has been compromised or even just, just drifting as per failure, right? It's just, you know, if you don't look at your watch and you, if you don't notice that the battery is drifting, all of a sudden you wind up five minutes late, um, which I almost did earlier today for a call um, because my battery is getting low. Well, you can wind up finding that issue a lot sooner than you would uh, one year later when it, after it's drifted or someone's compromised your data sets. Um, that might be really particularly true in a refinery where you're trying to monitor levels of offload or trying to monitor things such as um, looking for, for chemicals and, and leftover toxic uh, con uh, condensates in, in a tank, right? So I could easily shut down your facility if, the, if we thought that the condensate tank was full or uh, if we were looking, if we were monitoring to see how much diesel was left over in the backup generators and it said it was full, but it wasn't, or it said it was empty. And then we had to go rush out there and fill, fill up the, the tanks with diesel. So there is a lot of other aspects there that isn't just about looking for compliance and looking at the data, but also maintaining the integrity of the data. These devices are more than 10 years old. Uh, they have often hundreds of undisclosed vulnerabilities. And this kind of circles back to Rob Lee's chat on the Slack channel where, uh, what do you do? There's no bill of materials and a vendor's often uh, has end of life tombstone the devices fired everyone that ever worked on it, uh, acquired it, whatever. But in one case, a very common radio and I won't point names at a vendor, but it, it has over not 297 vulnerabilities in the kernel alone. We haven't talked about the shell. We haven't talked about the compiler. We haven't talked about the applications alone. That's just in one device. And many of those vulnerabilities are easily accessible uh, over a myriad of ways. And here comes my staring from Tim. And on my last point, uh, device security is lax. Uh, what that means is we have poor credentials, mismatched role access controls, terrible logs that don't track things. Uh, firmware updates are wide open. Very few people properly do uh, secure firmware updates. They might encrypt them, great, that, that's fantastic. Uh, that's terrible. Um, if everyone's looking for an example of what you should look at, it's the way Google does their Chromebooks. Um, that's amazing. Or even aircraft parts with manifests. And it's so often very easy to configure these type of devices without anybody ever noticing. So um, that's my, my last takeaways on this. And I hope it was a wonderful journey into Indiana Jones land. Thank you, Ron. That was fantastic.